153rd session of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group, where we meet here at Sammy's every first Monday of every month. And uh, tonight we have quite a crowd. We have the women outnumbering the men for the first time, I think, or for a long, first time in a long time. <laughs> Back when I was attracting all those psychologists who were checking me out to see if I was uh, crimping on their on their bailiwick, we had uh, I think five psychologists show up for several weeks, and then they just decided not. I used to. <laughs> He's not trying to do mental health, and I'm not trying to do mental health. So if you need a mental health expert, you really need. To go see a professional. I am not a psychiatrist. You're not a psychiatrist. So, so this evening, what we're going to do is I, I have two books of quotes of C.G. Jung, and we're going to select quotes that interest us, take turns reading those quotes, and then talking about them. But I wonder, because we have Debbie, Karen, and Maria who are new here, I wonder if you just say something about uh, why you're here and whether, um, you know, whether you know anything about Jung's work before this. And if you don't want to speak, well, Pat, you can say pass. <laughs> you, you don't even have to say pass. You can wave oh, away. So, but Debbie's a publisher, so you, you should be willing to say. All right. I'm uh, Deborah A. Bowman Stevens. Mm -hmm. uh, Deborah A. Bowman is the author. Deborah Stevens is the CEO of Placid Consultants Publishing. Um, I am a writer, editor, formatter, publisher, proofreader, etc., etc., etc. I'm also an author that writes fiction, uh, mostly paranormal. Uh, I am an ACPT and an ACPH. And what, what does that mean? Advanced Certified Psychological Hypnotherapist. Advanced Clinical Psychological Therapist. And. Um, I worked for the Department of the Army for 35 years. Wow. And, and you were working in mental health at that time? I was not. I was the Publications Control Office for the largest Army Major Command, the Army Material Command, on Eisenhower Avenue in um, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, you're not going to be able to take it any farther from that, but the mic is quite um, capable, so. Uh, you, you, Karen, do you want to say anything? Don't have to say anything. Um, oh, when did they drop you? No. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Maria, are you willing to say anything about your interest in Jung? And, 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 uh, if, if, if any, at the moment. Well, I have studied Jung before, and when I was in Venezuela, I started being trained to be a gestalt therapist. Uh -huh. And so one of the line of the, was to study young, but I think I have a lot of to learn here, and that's what I'm here. Okay, great. Well, we'll, we'll try to accommodate that. So, um, Karen, did you have a, a first quote that you liked that you wanted to read? I did. I had something that really spoke to me immediately, um, because situational um, for me, is everything that I've seen for many years. We always find in the patient a conflict which at a certain point is connected with the great problems of society. Hence, when the analysis is pushed to this point, the apparently individual conflict of the patient is revealed as a universal conflict of his environment and effort. And uh, I've had experience of working with, and I counted them. This is a factual thing, 65 different cultures. And without a doubt, and I was adopted, and I was adopted into immigrants of different cultures than my basically birth. And in the last two years, I have found them. And so I am very big on cultural 
experiences. As a teacher and as a student of learning, I do believe very strongly in how culture affects our entire holistic perception of everything around us, basically. Right. Uh, so let me, I, my hearing is not red hot, so what I'd like to do is read the quote again myself so that everyone at home can hear it. Now, which, which one is it? Just right at the very beginning. The, the very first yeah, one. the very first okay. couple of lines. All right. We always find in the patient a conflict which at a certain point is connected with the great problems of society. Hence, when the analysis is pushed to this point, the apparently individual conflict of the patient is revealed as a universal conflict of his environment, an epoch. Neurosis is nothing less than an individual attempt, however unsuccessful, to solve is not an ends per se thing in itself, but exists only in the hearts of individuals. And that is from Collected Works 7, paragraph 438 in new paths of psychology. Okay, so um, do you have some examples of how this oh, has come up? endless. I couldn't endless. Even, I, I mean, oh my goodness. Um, but even being adopted into two different cultures, Norwegian, Scandinavian, and Russian Jew, <laughs> and then being very Irish, um, it was very inquisitive. It's Irish. Ooh. Irish, Scotch, maybe a little Italian. How did that come about? They found me. Well, my students felt I was very Latin, and uh, they, they wanted me to do uh, my blood. Mm -hmm. And I was never interested. Even my husband couldn't get me into it for some reason. I was happy with my way I had been raised, mm -hmm. right? But it, they did, and so I did Ancestry.com just to find out my heritage. But then, lo and behold, out of the woodwork. <laughs> yeah. I always say, you know, there's no accident. It's just God being anonymous for some reason. I'm 71, and now I have 15 more relatives this year, just this year. Wow, that's impressive. It, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. But I don't have to do family politics. I can just be a friend. <laughs> so, uh, I'm joining your family. <laughs> <laughs> now, because we're not broadcasting, if you say something you want me to cut out, I can do it. <laughs> I haven't said my name. Yeah, that's right. No, but I, I'm, I'm just curious, where were you adopted from? Oh, wow. I feel Some like place uh, in the United this States? is us, yes. Um, <laughs> I actually have a picture of my first brother on my cell phone, uh, which which is very funny, actually. Um, and she's still living. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That and says she something. Man. Apparently, works for Homeland Security. <laughs> wow. Well, this is too ridiculous. She, worked, she I just, works for Homeland Security. I do have a picture of her, though. It's pretty amazing. She's not still working. I, well, she says, she, I, I don't think so. Of course, you never know. I mean, you look at Hetty on NCIS LA. But I don't know. She's in El Paso, uh -huh. Texas. The first Monday of the month is for this group, the local group. So, so anyway, Nancy, tonight we're... I have a question, though. Maybe you're not going to touch on it, but I did print out and read Go all of it. the stuff that you had another evening oh, about, about yeah. the quantum right, right. physics and the oh, correlation. Awesome. Could you just do like a five-minute thing? Yeah. In like, Could I do it? <laughs> Can you, not five minutes, but do you know, like... Well, let me put it this way. I have, I have read the article at least three times yeah, myself. I went one and a half times. I really wasn't sure what to make of it. Pardon? I wasn't sure what to make of it. I read it one and a half times. Okay, basically what it says is that Jungian psychology and quantum physics are the same thing. Basically, now I'm not an expert on quantum physics. So I, 
Oh, you are a physicist. I told you she was an engineer or something. Yeah, so, so, so that's why I'm like, yeah, it's all on a whole other different level that you can't explain, but you know it's out there and people can see it and measure it, but maybe not measure it, but you just, so I guess it's the way this was trying to make, it was like, we're going to prove that this is the same. So that's, that was our, that was our premise. Okay. Our premise is well, Indian I, psychology and chronic Please understand is the same. that this, this is it. 14 page this, essay is basically, it's yeah. basically a promo for their book, which right. is called Infinite Possibilities. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and I just ordered the book tonight myself uh, because the essay Tease me enough, so I want to know. Right, to right. Read it, and basically, what what they're saying. You've you probably heard this um, idea that light is either a photon, a particle called a photon, mm -hmm. or it's a wave. Okay. Now, what they're saying is that everything is like that. Okay. Everything is either a physical thing or it's a wave mm -hmm. and so so what they're saying is that when it's a wave it's a potentiality it doesn't physically exist but it exists mm -hmm. it's a form mm -hmm. and so uh, you know the example they give in the article is there are a hundred different levels of things that could happen, but when the observer comes along and something happens, then it becomes physical and then it's real. Okay, then it's in the physical world, the Newtonian world, rather than the quantum world. Okay, and so the big question is, what is the unified field theory? I'll get to that, but but I was just listening to a. a lecture by uh, Anne Belford Ulanoff. Uh, Anne Belford Ulanoff is a very famous Jungian analyst who has written 14 or 15 books and she is emerita professor of psychiatry and religion at Union Theological Seminary. Her best book is The Feminine and, and the Feminine and Christian Theology in Jungian? Yeah, something like that. But it's a real... You mentioned her several months ago. Yeah, I mean... But that book of hers will really lay out Jung in a, in a really interesting way because it focuses so much on the feminine. Right. But, but what floored me was when I heard her title which is Emerita Professor of Psychiatry and Religion at Union Theological Seminary, where lots of Presbyterian ministers go to, among others. And I'm saying, wow, I, I never even imagined that there could be such a thing. And I've been always trying to see the connection between Union psychology and religion. And, you know, that's what my talk ultimately was about. Okay, after 30 years of studying, I pulled it together in that talk called Finding the Living God. Because where is the living God? The living God is within us. And now right? you're working on physics. Huh? And so now we're adding physics, right? Okay. They want to, the whole thing has been to take science and religion and and bring them together. Bring, bring them together, right. It's, it's, it's not that easy because it's all layers. I mean, it's all layers, and so the layers are... Precisely. Well, I think quantum physics would draw them out of the, uh, out of the enlightenment into a, different, a whole different realm of, of, of um, understanding and thinking. And because I'm thinking of the enlightenment in terms of rationality and logos, that sort of thing, where there has... And the idea that everything can be reduced to physics, which it cannot. Which it cannot. Yeah. Yeah, Newtonian physics. I mean, what these guys basically say is that Newtonian physics is over as of the 20th century. It's, it's this layer. It's the, the enlightenment layer is up here. Right. 
and, well, and I'm talking enlightenment in terms of what 15th century starting the Renaissance. Right. So that was all logos, but it was all based on f the physical world, right? And the and the quantum layer is not in the physical world. Okay, it's forms, and it actually exists. Can I just say yeah. one little thing? Yeah, go ahead. I think his name is John, but anyway, John Wheeler, a physicist, and they used to. He said when he was in, younger, they used to play this game of twenty-one questions, and so they would start, and they would they would ask, uh, a, you know, they'd say, "Well, is it this?" And they'd say, "Yes," and then they would do that. And the next guy would go, "Well, if it's that, is it this too?" And yes. And so they'd get up to twenty-one, and they'd say, "What is it?" Have you heard this? Yeah, and, and so they get up to the 21st and they said, well, what is it? And they, they'll give an answer. Well, the, the, the tricky part of the whole thing is they had no idea what it would be when they started. It was by asking the questions that they created the answer. And that's sort of what, that's sort of what the uh, idea of what quantum physics is with the particle and the wave and that sort of thing. Or Schrodinger's cat. Or anything. Yeah, Schroding, Schrodinger's cat. But um, Anna Lenoff gave this interesting example in her lecture. She was saying, um, you know, you think for a long time that you might like to study poetry, okay? And so finally you decide you're going to buy an online poetry course, and you get it and you load it onto your computer, and then it sits there and nothing happens with it for years, okay? And, but it's, it's always their potential. And all the poems that could emerge from you, if you were writing poems, is all there in potential in your computer. Like and it's, a right, but it's only when you actually look at it and take the course and start to try that suddenly these things actually appear into the Newtonian world, something like that. Um, there are a lot of, uh, I go to a lot of poetry blogs, and there are, you know, we have all these different forms of poetry, okay? I have written poetry my whole life since I was nine. Okay, great. All those hakus and this and that and how many lines and all of that, you know what I did with all that? Well, threw it away. Yep, that's what most and I wrote poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you follow all the guidelines they give you of this is supposed to be so many lines, and, and I have a lot of people who do this, and they, they come to my blog to read my stuff, and they said, well, why is your stuff different? My stuff is different because I threw all that away, and I just write what's in my heart. Right. And can, phys can physics be in my heart, too? I believe it can. You don't, I think, agree with that, but I believe Why it. Why do you think I don't agree with that? Because you had trouble with religion and physics together. No. no. That's what I that. perceive then. No. I do have trouble with Christianity just because it irritates me. <laughs> but, but, no. My background is art, so I'm, a, I'm fully aware of the relationship with physics <laughs> and anything else. So. I have a family where I'm surrounded by art, and I'm, my art is words. Yeah, um, I with words. But, yeah, but there are a lot of artists in my family. Yeah. Did you have a goal here for what you were hoping to talk about? Uh, no. Okay. So, 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 well, you were going to get to the unified field theory. And okay. Well, let me let me work toward that let stuff. me yeah. work toward the unified field theory. So, basically, you know, there there are forms. So, a po as you say, poems have forms, and so my the form that I have written more than fifty poems in is called Villanelle. And it's the same villanelle. Okay, and so the most famous villanelle is uh, Dylan Thomas wrote a, a villanelle called, uh, or it starts out, do not go into that dark night or something. 
Do not go gently. Do not, oh, do not go gently. Right. Do not go gently. The line I like, though, is the green fuse. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower. That I like, though, is a okay. great line. Well, so, so anyway, I wrote 50 villanelles. And so I... It's a, it's a form that somehow it just worked for me, and I don't know why, okay? But it, it's like an archetype, okay, in the Jungian sense. It's out there, and if you build to that form, it works. And so I wrote some interesting poems that are available in the Dropbox in my poetry book. And my favorite one is called Symphony, okay? I want to play you like a symphony, draw a rosin bow across your silken breast with driving rhythms from the timpani. I'll, I'll guide you far from life's cacophony to hidden valleys, Mozart's sweet bequest. I want to play you like a symphony. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's the first six lines. I don't remember it. I don't remember all 14 lines, but it's 14 lines. All villanelles are 14. I wrote one ode, Ode to a Sunday Morning, which is 11 lines. Uh -huh. But otherwise you use lyric poetry. Or... Um, otherwise, I'm just free verse. Free verse. Whatever yeah. comes. Whatever My latest comes. poem is um, eight lines in a stanza, the next stanza is four, the next stanza three, the next six. It's whatever the message that comes out of my heart and my mind. But but you see, you did react to my, my I villain out, I certainly right? did. And but not as a poet. As a woman. As a woman, I reacted. Well, yes. well the, it's, in a, it's in a book called uh, uh, Seduction for the Soul is the name of the book. <laughs> Very nice. So, um, are you familiar with Pastoral Courtship by Thomas Randolph? No. I have studied it. Yeah. It's this long, mm -hmm. and he's uh, early 1500s, and it is absolutely one of the most beautiful poems I've ever written. I'm sure. I can send you a copy of it, but it is. Okay, that'd be and terrific. And he talks about the woman's body. And, yeah, have you read Pastoral Courtship? No, I've not. It is. Yeah, it is I would love to see that. Um, it is, um, Amazing. Yeah. What I like about what you're saying, and the name of the book even, your collection, is that Velanellas, as you probably know, are dancers. Yes, right. So uh, it's lovely, there's a courtship yeah. in the very form of your poetry. And then there's Symphony's Reply, which is conduct me firmly like a symphony. It's all in the Dropbox under under um, you know administrators are stuff, okay, and it all has adult warnings on it. And such. Thank you, my dear. So anyway, so this poet this poetry class that you have on your computer is a quantum form mm -hmm. that has the potential to teach you how to be a poet but it only if, as long as it's sitting there on your computer it's basically nothing right or it's it's a bunch of electrons that are spinning around there waiting for you to do something with them and so quantum physics is like that and so a quanta as I understand it a quanta doesn't exist unless you observe it right and so we get down to things that are smaller than atoms. We get down to the Higgs boson, right? So they had to build a, a device that's 17 miles in circumference and fire huge energy through it. And oh, by the way, they could prove that what, what Higgs found mathematically actually does exist. There is such a thing as a Higgs bo boson, and they could observe it. But, you know, does it exist when there's not huge energy running through CERN? I don't know. It doesn't, ex it doesn't exist is the answer. Well, uh, what you're saying there is 
the measurement itself may be creating yes yeah, the question like itself which is exactly what the wheeler thing was the right measurement the, right so the question itself so the the problem the the problem for getting physics and religion together and physics and Newtonian physics and quantum physics together is that phys Newtonian physics relies on physical being, right? And, um, pardon? And quantum physics does not. Particle physics does rely on physical being, but uh, quantum physics does not. And so it's, it is more a, a part of the psyche. And this is the distinction that Dr. Jung made. He says every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physis, the physical world. And so, so all these fundamentalists who are running around screaming, the Bible is true, the Bible is true. Well, yes, it is true. But it's not true in the physical world. It's true in the psychic world, in, in the psyche. And, and, you know, when you go back, you say, okay, wait a minute, let me think about that. And you go back to the Bible, and oh, by the way, all the big things that happen in the Bible are either dreams or visions. <laughs> right? <laughs> so they're, they're, they're all psychic events. Have you read the Gospel according to Thomas? I have, yes. I am reading it. Yeah, it's interesting. Oh, actually, it's <laughs> yep, actually. Because it opens up that, uh, it opens up what we're talking about. Right, and so the ancients knew this. Right. And, and that by that book was kept out of the Bible. Right. By Constantine. Right. And, it, right. And uh, and all this stuff was hidden away. No, I just and, finished reading that. Right. And so the result was that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were killed because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Literally. Yeah. And so well, the one thing uh, between the, the you were talking about the uh, the Newtonian and the quantum, right. and it seems to me from what you're saying that the quantum, the Newtonian is basically based. Well, it's based on physics, which means it, it is accessible and, and understandable through our sensibilities. Whereas quantum physics exceeds our ability to understand, given our uh, apparatus of life. In other words, it, it's almost uh, an alien intelligence and the way they get there is through the the uh, either through uh, well through quantum physics you would get there through the the mathematics which expands the human capabilities of of, of, um, of understanding by virtue that it exceeds our ability to relate to something through physics or through our physical or through our our, our bodies where as um, you know, Newtonian physics is all pretty much based on the idea that well, that makes sense, sense, huh? Right. And then you've got you've got the uh, you've got the old uh, Hindu you know guy in a cave who's sitting there, um, and he understands that too because he is able to withdraw himself from within the human psyche, uh, in a, in a, and and hit a base level that exceeds human understanding. So. Uh, there's a kind of a sense of being in a presence of something, and I think what physic, the quantum physics, is sort of mathematically drawing us out like that too, in the same sort of way. It's just coming from the outside in instead of the inside out. Yeah. So, you, so you basically said it, which is that the unified field is the human being. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. I guess so. I don't get that. Well, New Newtonian I have to, physics. I have to go sit in my cave no. hole while I'll be back. <laughs> Newtonian <laughs> physics <laughs> requires a physical <laughs> entity, right? Newtonian physics requires a physical entity, but the psyche isn't physical, okay? The psyche has forms, okay? And the only way you can bring the two together is within a human being. 
Okay. Well put. And then you can do it. And and so and that's what religions have all been about, really. Okay. Is you know, why did in the Soviet Union they ran religion right out of the place, okay? Religion was verboten for seventy years, right? And as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989, boom, in three years, all the cathedrals were rebuilt. And, and, uh, and people... Been suppressed. It was a form of like, overweening materialism. Right. Exactly. And, and so, so the point is you, you can't get that part of the human being out of the human being because we have spiritual needs, right? And, and so you have to have a spiritual way of looking at life. Okay, that's what it's about. Well, and that's what religion is about. Taking too. it back to physics, I always thought the unified field was the union of uh, the magnetic, the, elect, uh, the electrical field and, the gravi and gravitation. I well, thought. that's what they think. That, that's what Newtonian physicists yeah, think. They want to keep drawing it back to physics. So you yeah. know they're Einsteinian, they're still Newtonian in sense. Yes. Okay. Right. So they're and still thinking of the material. The so so they're, they're looking for a unified field that's in the physical universe, okay, which it isn't. Okay. That's the point. There's no, there's no, there's no field that you can unify in the physical universe. but. Um, quantum physics is forms. You can do it in the stream of consciousness that only right. human beings can. And and so it, it's well, I think you know I, what are the potentials? You know, we're all writing books, I guess. But mm -hmm. you know, the the story I'm writing has <laughs> to do with what's what is it that exceeds human intelligence? You know, what, what is it that engages the world from another from another. Uh, way of understanding, you know. So you've got, and I call it affordances, but you know, you've got you a chip, affordances. Affordances. J.J. Gibson, he wrote about it. Um, but he had to do, so how do you open the door, how do you, someone know there's a, there's a doorknob there. Oh, that affords you the opportunity to open the door. Okay, every species, every animal has its own sort of set of affordances. It's, it's way of negotiating in the world. What if you're a, a creature, an alien, for example, and you've got a whole different set of affordances? Quantum physics might be very much that our moving up into that level of understanding that exceeds the typical or you know even e extreme human understanding. So there's another kind of intelligence that has a different relationship to its, let's call it, environment. And it, it exists, and it might even be walking around us, you know, because we would be irrelevant to it. But there would be a different way of engaging the, the world. So it's a different kind of understanding. Right. I mean, there's the story that if aliens came to Earth, they might not even recognize us as beings. They might think of us as uh, colonies. Plants. Of, well, or no, co colonies of other living beings because well, it's like literally a, that's it's what like we a are. like a two-dimensional world. What's the name? I forget the name of it. But there's this guy that wrote in like early 20th century or late. And he, and he, he say like, the whole world is two-dimensional. And, and if something three-dimensional intersects that, to the two-dimensional people, it look like a flash of light or something. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> because it would make no sense, it would just it would just go. There would be no dimension to it. It would just. Right. Would Meanwhile, right. physicists want you to believe that there's eleven uh, dimensions or something right. like that, right? And they, actually, there's more than that. I'm sure. I'm sure there are. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, yeah, and that's just how many measurements they put out there. And eternity. Yeah. All right. So putting putting this article to bed because I'm going to. Go through. Yeah, this is through pretty, the, pretty deep stuff. I'm us. gonna, I'm gonna read it uh, next yeah, week. Um, this, out, this was an attachment with uh, one of his emails. Her? Your, what you sent out was an attachment. That's right, and okay. it's, it's I'm also. I'm not on your email list. Yeah. And it, and that. it's in the Dropbox. Right. In the Dropbox on the 
yeah. for okay. today's yeah. day, 12 okay. 2 19. I would like to see that also. I printed this out on uh, what? Okay, the but, sixth of the, oh, no. but I'll also be happy to send it to you by email. But let me, what I'm going to do here is just read the abstract of this paper and read the conclusion. Okay. Okay. So, so that yeah. you get yeah. one, one concise thing here. Okay, so we describe, they say, we describe similarities in the ontology of quantum physics and of Carl Gustav Jung's psychology. In both of these disciplines have led at the same time to revolutionary changes in the Western understanding of the cosmic order, discovering a non-empirical realm of the universe that doesn't consist of material things but of forms. These forms are real, even though they are invisible because they have the potential to appear in the empirical world and to act in it. We present arguments that force us to believe that the empirical world is an emanation out of a cosmic realm of potentiality whose forms can appear as physical structures in the external world and as archetypal concepts in our mind. Accordingly, the evolution of life now appears no longer as a process of adaptation of species <coughs> of species to their environment, but as adaptation of minds to increasingly complex forms that exist in the cosmic potentiality. The cosmic connection means that the human mind is a mystical mind. So that's the abstract. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving right along here. Well, I'm not going to read the whole conclusion, but because it's three pages long. But let me write, read the first well, paragraph. Just and, a quick comment. I, the whole idea that the forms are real is, is kind of bizarre. Well, Which, the psyche is real. It's just not physical. Yeah. But I don't think there's a common thread of yes, the need I to, to, to evoke meaning. And you don't think that, that, there are, that all human beings, the forms that we seek, are the same? Uh, yes, sort of. Yeah. I, I think archetypes exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they, they're, that's they're what they're things. talking about. They're, they're like formal properties. They're, they're not, forms. They're, yeah. But they're, they're like a mathematical matrix. But it's like mm -hmm. I was saying, chipmunks have their forms, we have our forms. Right. And they're they're sort of relative to the to their eminent, eminent you know, their uh, existential uh, origins or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, go ahead. So you believe in archetypes exist. Archetypes are, are a definition of the highest possible combination of well, I don't see it as high. Well, I would see it as the lowest. Well, uh, okay. The, this <laughs> comes. Also come. <laughs> yeah. This because comes back to the. It, come, it comes up through. It's, you know, it, it's. They're heuristics. Yeah, you got a body, and it, it's it, 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 it's like a plant. It comes up and, and sprouts into the world. And right. It has certain characteristics. If you're an oak tree, you got this kind of leaf. You got that kind of yeah. leaf. If you're a maple, you know. If you're a, a male, you've got this kind of leaf. And female, you know. So. Right, which, which is individuation for all of them. So that if if you're yeah. if you grow up from an acorn, you're going to be an oak tree, well, right? That's potential. And you're going to. That's your potential in in the acorn is the potential of being the oak tree, right? Yeah. And you will have certain characteristics that are like all other oak trees. Mm -hmm. However, According every, to the way we look at, you know, I mean. However, every oak tree is mm -hmm. different. Every oak tree is different. And every human being is different accordingly. And that's what individuation is about, is becoming all you're, you were ever meant to be. Okay. Be all you can be. You were in the army. Let it go. You... No, I mean, what are you? If you, you want to be an oak tree, become an oak tree. Yeah, you just you just one of those liberal, you know, boomers. <laughs> <laughs> what? He doesn't know me, does he? <laughs> Apparently not. Son, Apparently. you can be anything you want to be. 
<laughs> okay, so let me read the first paragraph of the conclusion. Uh -huh. um, by studying the human psyche, Jung discovered mental properties of the universe, which classical physics had suppressed. Quantum physics has now brought them back. If materialism is false, writes Barus, then what is true? In Infinite Potential, which is their book, we have answered these questions in many ways. The facts show us that there is a non-empirical realm of reality that doesn't consist of things, but of forms. These forms are real, even though they are invisible, because they have, they have the potential to appear in the physical world and act in it. They can do, excuse me, they can do this in two ways. They can find consciousness as thoughts in our mind and actualize as material structures in the external world. Thus, the conscious and empirical world is an emanation out of a realm of mind-like forms. The quantum physics is a form of psychology. The psychology is, a, is of the cosmic mind. In the same way, Jung's psychology is also a branch of physics that is the physics of the mental order of the universe. So, okay, I like so that last what, I, I do, do too. too. Yeah, very, very much. And what I bring back around, I don't want to keep picking on you, just that you're there and you have a lovely smile. <laughs> but anyway, this all comes back down to what is non physical is what we can manifest. Right, we manifest. We, we manifest. manifest. Right. We man I manifest that I'm going to look like this. If you want to look like an oak tree, manifest it and you shall become one. Sure. But, or, <laughs> you, you know, if it. you have the, <laughs> if you have, a, you, you might have 12 poetry books in you. I would agree with uh, you in my 20s, but I don't know anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 well, well, I'm we just a child. Well, you know, you're mighty <laughs> oak, Bill. Yeah. Well, we would have worked together as a group. Oh, it would have been an oak tree. Yeah. yeah, but that would be a perception of someone else's being. You know, I just say I want to be an yeah. oak tree, Debbie. I'm not going to be an oak tree. Well, at least not out running free in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, you could, in your imagination, you could be. I don't know. But in your psyche, you could be. Yeah. That's the point. Mescal. In, uh -huh. in, in your in your psyche, you could be. I right. can't change my DNA. Skip, who suggested going back to your paragraph that you mentioned earlier yes. that the um, God, evolution of the species <laughs> was not so much an adaptation yeah. of the physical world, but was rather, uh, in fact, an adaptation of our minds to form. Right. To forms that we, who, who suggested that? Who's they is that young? Um, or, the, or the writer of this. Uh, these writers, I think. Mm -hmm. and I love how that ties in with the last statement. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's actually just a repeat of it, honestly. But, but um, anyway, I've ordered the book. So uh, for Dr. Lothar Schwartz, I want to assure you that I have purchased your book. Schwartz? I thought it was Schaefer. Schaefer, I beg your pardon. May I share Dr. Schaefer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What yes, sir. to find that book? I had a very... Um, I had a, um, on Thanksgiving morning, I messed up my Thanksgiving plans, and I was reminded by my family, I won't show how, but I was reminded by my family of how much I've been living in a delusional state for the last two or three years. And living in a delusional state as I have been has been the only way I can cope with the chaos that is in fact my life. But they reminded me of the status quo. And it really shook me, and I've had an awfully self-judgment, uh, fearful time of it from Thanksgiving morning till recently, till yesterday maybe. Yeah, in a lesson I was giving yesterday to a young man, I, uh, I mistook some of the things he said, and I was yelling at him, and he was saying, what are you saying that, you know, because I was misjudging everything around it, really put my boat into a rocky place and the only way I could cope and am coping right now is by keeping this mantra what are the facts what are the facts don't make judgments what are the facts
Mm -hmm. And I find this such a wonderful thing. I don't know what made you write this and give it to us to live in the eternal moment, but what are the facts here and now? Yeah. Not yes. the fear of the future, nor the regret of the past. What are the facts here and now? I, I, let me tell you how this came up. Okay, aside from the fact that I wanted to take up calligraphy, but but that doesn't have anything to do with what I actually wrote. And um, for people who are watching this video, I've given all my friends this calligraphy that took me two months to do. Um, and moreover, I'm putting a copy of it in the Dropbox. So if you want to join our Dropbox or you're a member of it under 1202.19 for handouts, you'll find a copy of this which you can print out. Um, and the reason it took me two months is because to learn calligraphy you have to make a lot of mistakes and it took me two months to get through a whole page without making two bad mistakes. <laughs> Only God is perfect, right? <laughs> that's, yeah. how, that's how you honor him. Or <laughs> 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 We don't have to define God, <laughs> but um, so anyway, I I did this talk, finding the living God, about a month ago, at Unity by the Bay, and uh, you can find it on YouTube if you haven't watched it. But the very last thing in that talk, it's a two-hour talk. The very last thing was the eternal moment. And it connected with everybody in the room. It really did. And, uh, and it was almost the only thing they wanted to talk about. Aside from love, they wanted to talk about love too. But Your question and answers after your right. talk were absolutely incredible. Yeah. That was, I mean, everybody had something different, but they all meshed together right. from your talk. You're going through a hard time right now, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm an empath, and I knew that already just yeah. when you sat down. Um, what happens when you're faced with the troubled times, just the facts, just the facts, it keeps you from getting outside energy that you can't handle right now, yeah. so you are doing the work. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and so Brendan, um, I, I'm not a mental health professional, so I'm not going to say anything in that context, but I, I'm going to say uh, something that's happened to me and it might be useful to you. Um, there's a woman who's in the advanced reading group, her name is Nancy Pfaff, and she has. Um, she has honored me by allowing me to interview her for more than 10 hours about her personal Christian individuation. Okay, and she was um, late in life, relatively late in life, around 50. Uh, she's now 77, but around 50, she got a master's degree in Christian spirituality. But she'd been a around the church her whole life. and. Uh, a couple of times she actually lost her faith, lost her connection to God because of things that the religious people had said to her, okay? Once when she was like 12 years old and, you know, once when she had a pastor when she was about 30. Um, but in this last week, from November 22nd on, we did the fifth in a series which is now on the website called uh, A Christian Individuation. And the fifth one um, began, begins with uh, an event that occurred to her in May. She, she really thought she was dying. And when I talked to her um, in May, I thought she was dying too. Um, but she had been a, a consultant to um, to fundamentalist churches, okay, on Christian spirituality, and she's she'd been a um, uh, 
I forget what she calls it, but it's a kind of uh, advisor on spirituality, right? In fundamentalist churches, mind you, fundamentalist churches, but she's very young in because she met some young ins years ago. And um, anyway, she was in a very rough place. And meanwhile, I had, I had a bone to pick about the devil and fundamentalists and the devil, right? Because I had had this experience. I actually had a vision of Mephistopheles plopping down in the car next to me on one occasion when my daughter told me that she thought I was going to hell on her 22nd birthday. And I said, you know, who teaches anybody to say such a thing to their parent, right? And, and so that was a bugaboo for, of mine for a long, long while about Christianity, especially fundamentalist Christianity. And so here I had this consultant on Christian spirituality to fundamentalist churches on the telephone. And I wanted to know, Nancy, what do you know about the devil and what, what are you teaching people? And the funny thing was, she says in this interview, in, in, the, in the first and second half of it, of it, there's 5A and 5B, in the first half, she's in this down in the dumps stage where she thinks she's dying. And I asked her about the devil, and she said, you know, I hadn't th thought about the devil in decades. And all of a sudden, my life opened up and I realized um, that I was very far uh, from what I was trying to teach people. And in the second half of it uh, is called Rebirth, and it's a very, very moving interview. I urge you to take a look at that interview, and especially that, that part five of it. It's just amazing. Thank you. And, and she attributes the fact that I asked her that question to snapping her out of it. So now she's seem, seeming, I don't know, 10, 15 years younger than she was seeming in May, and she's revitalized her life. And so what about your music? Doesn't the music help? Uh, yeah, because the music, when you perform it, is in the eternal now. You That's cannot, exactly right. You cannot perform unless you are in the moment. Yes. And That's why this bottom, the last sentence, bounced me. I bounced off of it. It, it bothered me mm -hmm. because you can't, you can't make in every moment the best of the possibilities, which sounds like a moral imperative. When you when you're in the moment, you're letting it happen. You're not making mm -hmm. anything. No. Yeah. When I'm in the moment of performing. I'm unconsciously bringing everything that has passed, but you see, because I'm unconscious of it, it's not informing anything but my body, maybe my mind. It's informing me in a Newtonian sense, perhaps, or it's informing me in a muscular sense. Uh, well, that's how NLP works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it and is. Yeah. That's exactly how it works. And dreams. And dreams. So I was just wondering if how that was going with the music. Are you, are you working with that at all, or are you just letting it go? Um, you know what I, I have to say. I, I, I have not done it, but that's exactly also where I go. If it, it, it is, I have managed to stop it, my pain in its tracks by saying, "What are the facts?" Mm -hmm. I've managed to stop it, mm -hmm. okay. and the pain is no longer with me. But um, were it to get worse, I would do that. I would exact. I would go and sit at my organ, and play, and play, and play, until that cathartic present took over. And and that's exactly what Jungian analysts and Anne Belford Ulanoff say you should do. Yep. You should do something creative. Bill says it too. But I can't. Bill does it too. I can't do that unless there's a deep feeling. Like, I can play the piano mechanically, but if I have a deep feeling, I mean, I can play the same piece two different w ways, and the one way has deep meaning, and the other way is like, 
nothing. I mean, it's, yeah, there has to be a feeling that well, comes it's, upon you somehow. It, it, yeah, it's the difference between a high school senior who is a capable pianist and Ben Clyburn, for example, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and the and the point is, it's whatever is your thing. Exactly. The, the important thing is the spaces between the notes. It's not the notes, yes. right? It's the presence between the notes. It's what exists between the notes. Right. And so that's quantum. That that's form. And that's the, actually that's the very interesting thing about the measure. People think that when you count, I'm conducting a performance on Sunday and it's oh I love it I've been conducting for years and you know people see conductors hands they do that oh, very regular one two three four that kind of thing but no it's never one two three four or if it is one two three four I can't say one two three four in a regular way I'm always saying one two three four mm -hmm. I'm always allowing more space between four things which should be equal but nobody listens to them equally. That's right. why it's so difficult when you have a machine playing background music. And, and this is yeah. the Alleluia yeah. chorus that you're doing? Well, yeah, the Handel's Messiah, yeah. Messiah, and where, where is That's it? It's at St. Stephen's Church where in Crownsville. Crownsville. At three o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Oh, I, was, okay. wasn't, I was at the other one at Episcopal Church last year, Messiah, near mm -hmm. but it was how... Yeah, Holy Trinity. Yes. They do a great one, too. Oh. It was incredible. It really was. I so it's the whole of the Messiah. Oh no, just the Christmas part. Just yeah, part one. It is uh, it'll absolutely take an hour nice. and then there'll be refreshments afterwards. And, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I know that my Redeemer liveth. No, we're not doing that. One. We're not doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. This is what Jung was talking about too when he was going through this Red Book phase. And it was before it was the red book, it was the black book or whatever. But he had the gun in the in his in his drawer mm -hmm. and he kept having to recite his his address and his relation and and so forth, right? He had, sort he, of thing. he had to focus back on the facts. Focus right? on the facts. Mm -hmm. Right. So how many of you in the last five minutes have been conscious of the fact that you're sitting in a pizza restaurant talking about philosophical ideas. I mean, ha have any of you been conscious of the, our surroundings no. in the last five minutes I before haven't. I mention it? I have not. Been. I was conscious of the fact there wasn't as much noise with the plates and everything. So that was Oh, that's a good one. To me. Yeah. I was yeah. noticing conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were? Yeah. Outside of where? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even know where I was. Yeah, right. I don't have my contacts in, well, but I can see. You, you have to understand that Bill and, and John I went are jaded because they've been here like 80 <laughs> times. We have a history. <laughs> they have but, a history. But, but I'm fascinated by seeing to how other people perceive things and what uh, say people. Yes. Like, like my, mm -hmm. my boyfriend, he's an astrophysicist, and Richard Friedman, or Feynman, he was oh, his Feynman. mentor. Was Feynman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Caltech. Really? Yes, Very yes. Man. And so I'm interested in listening to all of you. Uh, he, he thinks I really get quantum physics. I don't think I do, but he does, and well, I'll take it. Well, bring him next time. Well, he's in San Diego right <laughs> now working we'll on sensors him. for the, yeah, it, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. For quantum computing. But that was I'm, a I'm really getting into oh. Richard Feynman. He, he, a lot. Have you read his books? He wants me to. Oh, you have must. I, I, I mean, I, I like, I I like what he's doing. I think Charlie is fine, but I think, I think, I think he was one of Wheeler's. But when he says I like him, it just like, oh my God, what a compliment. Don't even I know. think he was one of Wheeler's. You should students. start with the joy of finding things out. Read that okay. one. I'm going to tell Dottie that you can't put him down. Me. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. He's very amusing. And he was his, yeah, I am his mentor. He went to Caltech. So, you know, I'm learning a lot about that. Okay, but, but the point I was trying to make is that where, was your, where, the, was your where we are when mm -hmm. we're not seeing the restaurant around us, and we, you know, in fairness, these two guys are jaded, so. But they don't seem jaded to me. Well, they, but they've had the oh, experience of being here, being here so many times that they, they um, what, notice other things, right? Oh. Like you notice there right. aren't as many plates. Right. Oh. right. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, they they well, might. I, they know, I have not. I don't I've know. I've only listened to the video. Yeah. And so, so the point is that um, we enter what Ulanov calls the psychoid layer, which is a layer of uh, the psyche that's not in the physical world. Okay, mm -hmm. it's it's only those of us who are here tonight, and maybe someone who is watching this video, who just gets engrossed in the conversation maybe. Okay, it's not being broadcast, but but when they watch the video, people can get engrossed with what, what the conversation is. And that allows something to change subtly in your unconscious. Interesting. And uh, it, and as I understand it, this is what analysts do. I mean, the first, the first thing that, as I understand it from Ulanov, she wrote this book called uh, Psychoid and the Soul, uh, and one other thing, I think, but anyway, you can look at her, her books, but uh, she, uh, she says, well, the first stage of analysis is only when the client says, well, empty frats is happening to me, then the analyst says, oh, yeah, that happened to me. Too, right? And and That's so, acceptance. right? You're and not the and only one. right, you're not the only one. And then they go on talking, and it comes like, well, everybody's like that. <laughs> it's not only you, right? <laughs> and, and so that so that's the second stage. And that, but then the third stage is this psychoid layer where you're entering. It, it's like when you're when you're out at dinner with a new boy or girlfriend, right? And you get into conversation and everything else falls away, right? And it, it, there's only the two of you and information, somehow something unconsciously is going on between you. And... Um, but that's happened here tonight, but it's happened with all of us. Yeah, it happens with everyone. So... Yeah, but go ahead, Marie. Me working with child, deep autistic kids. Yeah. That's yeah. the only way to go. Yeah. You know, yeah. Number, number one, you are in the present because they are in the present. But there's a way of you you go to at least in my experience, right? So you go in that space, mm -hmm. and um, you go into that space to the point that one of the kids. You know, we were doing a game of codes to go to one place that he represented physically, right? Right. And so we let other people, I, I brought something to play with him, and it was like a, making a code. And I said, um, Christopher, um, I'm the code for me. And he said, you knew the code even before you met me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but that that's a unique space mm -hmm. that really opens the communication and I can bring them out in right. a way, right? right? Through my involvement. Yeah. So and but those unique minds yeah. drawn you there. It's more difficult for us because we are always connected, whether we like it or not, the chair is too hard or he makes a movement and distracts me. But that's very, very prevalent in that kind of mind. Yeah. And you unite it's like <laughs> and then and come back. Right, and um, what's been very interesting in our advanced reading group, which we do on um, Wednesdays at 1.30, uh, is that um, th those people who are autistic have got, gotten into a very deep understanding of things. In one case, um, one of the women is uh, very um, deeply understanding the work of BTS, the K-pop boy band, okay, which is extremely popular. There was just a, the Mellon Music Awards this last weekend, and they won eight awards, and they allowed, in this two-and-a-half-hour presentation, they allowed them to have 34 minutes on television live. Um, and 
but she is very much into the into the um, the symbolism of everything that they're doing on stage and their music, which is intentionally Jungian, okay, is known to be intentionally Jungian. And their next album is going to be called uh, Map of the Soul Shadow. Um, yeah. And the other woman is very much into the Star Wars um, movies. And, um, and so that's been very interesting that they have been able to bring out for even me because I've been interested in Star Wars and the symbolism of Star Wars yeah. for years. But, you know, here's this uh, woman who can get at it better than I can get at it. And uh, uh, so it's, it's very interesting how they play. And these people do interact with us uh, very well um, on our advanced reading group. Um, one of them is a, uh, is a, a software engineer. And the other one is a, uh, uh, she's, she actually works in a school for autistic people. And one of her jobs is to communicate with parents who come in with new, newly um, diagnosed children and show them that there's a future. Um, because I'll ask you about your coding. Can you know if you have this code with this boy? Can you revisit that code next week? Will he remember it? It was, it was a dice with little figures, but what was, the code was not fixed. It was, and I didn't know that I was going to use, I needed to connect to the board, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what I brought, and that's what worked. Mm -hmm. right. Actually, he was playing first with a ball making, I go into that space. So he was first playing with a ball make of light, and that didn't take me that far. So the code in itself is irrelevant. It was the, the tool that right. we found that. to open into that space. And yeah. it, was really it was really interesting because, you know, and we even make a space and we went in and only I wanted out when I said, Christopher, I need to go to the bathroom. And he said, okay, let's go out. And then we invited the parents that, the mother, that never was in that space, right? She couldn't understand, right? Mm -hmm. So we visit the mother and she said, no, it's only for young people like you and I, not for old people. And the mother was like, <laughs> you know, she didn't understand that my spirit was the young spirit with him. So, it, it, but it was, the, the interesting thing for me was that there was a way to go in, but he, he knew that, he said, you had the coat even before you met me. You know, it is like this tunnel, because that's what you're describing. He said this, that to you. Yes, yeah, yeah. that to me. That's you thing. know, so this, he, when, when I, I, because I was there, yeah. I was in there, you know, and not many people can be in there. So that really, you have to be totally absorbed of the reality that it's there. It's organic. Basically, I find his world so interesting that I'm drawn. If I find your yeah. world interesting, I'm drawn to you and I observe it. But the code is irrelevant. There were like little clouds or, mm -hmm. you know, keys or something. And every code, you know, whatever the other people threw or the dice, I said, this is good enough to enter? And he would say yes or no. Do you think it's important to enter his world even if he wasn't in your classroom? Is it a good thing for him? Well, I, enter, I only enter, it was sitting home. I, okay. I was doing an observation at home. But I only enter the space if he allowed me to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's like I have to be very passive mm -hmm. and very quiet, mm -hmm. right, for him to acknowledge me. Mm -hmm. When he acknowledged me, then I know I can go in. Mm -hmm. Right? And so it's that, that's the difference when we erupt in somebody's life we think, you know, that's what it is. No, you are quite, especially with this kind. Should we try? If you're still, you will know if you can yeah. go in. If you not, humbly, you don't go. Yeah, you know. okay. 
No, but it's it's very interesting how these two women have been drawn to our reading group, and I, I've I've had to be very emphatic that this is not a psychotherapy group. Mm -hmm. This is a reading group where we're just reading young and. Wednesdays at 1.30. Yeah. But it's online. Well, it's not on YouTube. It, it's in the Dropbox, so mm -hmm. if you're a member of the advanced group, you can, you can see all the, um, all the classes we've done, because we've done all of ION, and we've done about uh, three-quarters of Mysterium mm -hmm. Conjunctionis now. And so there's now 64 or 5 videos that are two hours long or longer. Um, so there's a hundred over 150 hours of information there uh, in seminar form. Okay, but and these days we're getting about 10 people live. There's 68 members of the advanced reading group, but most of them watch it in playback because they can't come on at 1.30 in the afternoon. But it's been very interesting to see how these two women um, both spontaneously came out and said that they were autistic. Okay. And, pardon? No, I was just going to say, I did want to say in what we've been saying about this, on the spectrum there are just so many different levels, and it is so wonderful now, they're starting to identify with that. So by her saying this to you, gives her some clarification of how you might accept her. The spectrum is really interesting. Now, Asperger's is what most science people have, <laughs> they have a little bit of Asperger's in them, they do. But they're identifying, like for example, if there's an autistic, I dealt with autism, like, and if, if there's a substitute, and it's a regular classroom, these people don't know that that's an autistic person. But now they're, like, they're saying it, and they're saying very, I have a little bit of autism, or I have a little bit, and this is when they get a little older. But this is to keep them from getting in problem. Because, as you know, they can be, or it depends, I don't know these women, but on the spectrum, there's different levels. Yeah, sure. I, that I understand, but I, I've never they, studied they it. They are self-identifying themselves now, which is really very nice and very helpful to others around them. And that doesn't happen all the time, but we try to teach them to do that. It makes them much more acceptable you know, to mm -hmm. the regular. And, you know, honestly, I would never have known that they were. That's what I mean. I would never have known that they were if they hadn't said so. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because they they have real lives. They make real contributions. High-functioning. Pardon? High-functioning. Yeah, they're high-functioning, yeah. no uh, doubt. And they have certain gifts. And they have amazing and, and, gifts. Yeah, and they're amazing gifted, gifts. apparently. Amazing and IQs. sometimes on those mystical, spiritual places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did I you see the video or the documentary on Temple Grandin. Have you heard of her? No. Temple Grandin, is, she's, she's uh, autistic, but she uh, she got her degree in animal husbandry. And 60% mm -hmm. and or so of the slaughterhouses use her architecture because she got into, because she could relate what was going on with mm -hmm. the animals as they were going to go into the slaughterhouse. Their stress. And their stress levels. Oh, that is really And she knew they were doing it all wrong. And so the fight wow. that she had for mm -hmm. for them to believe what she was saying is, was true. There's even a movie. Okay. So the documentaries yeah. on Netflix, you yeah. can watch yeah. about that. I've seen her I speak. Have, have you seen that? But the documentary is really good. The story is yeah. really good because it just brings her to light from wow. a young girl up to, and she's a professor in a college. Yeah, yeah. 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 And her yeah. name is Temple, Temple Grandin. Grandin. She wrote, I can remember um, Temple. Yeah. Animals Grandin, in Translation, mm -hmm. and she wrote um, Thinking in Pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, really good, yeah. And of right. course, it's her view from her experience. Right. You know, well, other people have other. Right, and other and both of the, both of these women are very good at at thinking symbolically. Yes. And you know, when 
when the one came to me because it got started because BTS came out with this album in April where um, it's called uh, Map of the Soul Persona and um, and it's based on a Jungian analyst book, that Mary Map Stein's of the Soul by Murray, Mary uh, Stein. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm in that. Right. Okay. So um, when that came out, a lot of people were trying. I was very excited about it because I'm saying, you know, I've been trying to think about how we could get psychology into the schools, and knowing that you know fundamentalist Christians will never allow it in the schools. And so how, do, how does it get into people's minds? Hey, BTS, they've got 80 million that followers. Which follows Young's life from beginning to end. Right, and, and that's the amazing thing that BTS is doing. It's a great book. So, so BTS is going right around no, so. the religious structure and the, you know, and the psychological structure. They're just doing these songs, and, they're, and so all these young all people... There all around the world, 80 million of them, as of April, now it must be way over that, um, are well, just... business models to write their songs and their albums based on some novel or book or short story. Right, but they're also, but they're also especially about yeah. Jungian-related right, things, right? right. And, and so even just go to the, the website and get, the kids get their book list. Right. And I was telling my granddaughter, like, this is the greatest way. How are you going to tell kids to read? Right. Oh, let's make a song about exactly. this. Exactly. And now, yep, right. So how the kids can read. Right. right. Absolutely. It, it's a brilliant approach. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I watched their uh, concert at Wimbledon uh, because they, were, they made it available online. So for 30 bucks, you could watch it online. And it, it was just amazing. I mean, these, these concerts are, are truly amazing. And so anyway, um, one of our members came to me and she said, well, have you seen this, this, and this, all these symbols about BTS? And I said, wow, no, I, I didn't, but I started to interact with her, and, I, and I'm seeing that she's getting all the symbolism that Jung talks about. And so I'm saying, wow, you know, could, you know, would you be interested in being in our advanced group? And she said, I'm not sure I can be in the advanced group. I'm very shy. And I said, well, you don't have to say anything. Just come and just be there and um, and so she started to do that and she really likes it now and she's still shy um, but the other young woman um, is you know she's a software engineer and she does interact with us pretty well so, so well that I don't notice that there's any issue with her too. And, and she didn't know until she was, I guess, 23, she didn't have a diagnosis. Well, a lot of times you, they don't get a diagnosis right away because there's so many levels. But there's two... Oh, Nancy, I'm, I have something for you. Just a moment. Give me one minute here. All right, you, you go ahead and talk. <laughs> All I was going to say is that when I, was stu I studied... Um, ASD for a long time um, uh, because I used it in a character in my book and there are two things I went to a lot I do a lot with blogs because I'm a writer and I reach out to a lot of other bloggers and have a lot of followers so there's two things happening right now as we speak that has a lot to do with this group he's talking about one is that every single ASD case is different there there are different levels as you put it but they're also each case there are no two alike yeah. and the I am in touch with a lot of ASD people through my blog because uh, I have numerous autoimmune deficiency problems I started working with autoimmune disorders and women and that led to the ASD and children and the other thing that's happening with the blogs is ASD uh, Individuals uh, and Osbergers do not want to be classified as mentally ill anymore. There is a big movement, huge, 
they don't want to be called oh, mentally not. ill. Oh, that's the way they're classified right now by the medical industry. Are they in the DSM? Yes. Yes. Really? Mm. Yes, they are. Well, and because of that, they have a movement going on right now saying we don't want to be called that we have a mental condition. They may not call it mentally ill. We don't want to be called, said that we have a mental brain condition. I think the word ill is, is, is yes. It's not. It's not. Well, some doctors, some doctors, some psychiatrists do use ill and do use drugs. I'm very anti-drug. Very anti-drug. Yeah, uh, I think, and I think most of the neurotypicals are, you know, oftentimes want to put a label on Exactly. Yes. Push a pill. And I've been going through this for 30 years of my life. Well, actually, I have been doing it my entire life, too. I just didn't know it until 30 years ago. Yeah, when you start, until somebody says something, you just think it's the way everybody is. Exactly. I thought I was normal also and then found out I was different. Yeah. I was 19. It was a shock. It was a shock. It was a shock. It didn't bother and then me. <laughs> Ten years later, then, I started collecting <laughs> autoimmune conditions like uh, yeah, the, some people do baseball cards. Uh, I'm walking for the first time these past two years for the first time in over a decade. I've been in a wheelchair most of my life. Uh -huh. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah, no, that's the autoimmune stuff. I, uh, I, well, I think I don't like names and labels uh, because to me it's all inflammation. Why we have to call lupus? Because it's on my face. Why we have to call it rheumatoid arthritis? Because it's in my joint. Why we have to call it cancer? Because it's in my intestines and it's a tumor. Why we have to call it an atrial septal defect? Because I was born with a hole in my heart. Why do I have to have all these titles? And I just had celiacs You're added. One of the most titled people I've ever met. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I don't like that. Yeah. I don't want to be a title. It's all inflammation. Let's get rid of those words. Because those words only create, they create symptoms. Right. So ASD creates symptoms. That's why they don't want to be considered a mental condition. I don't want to be considered an autoimmune condition. I want to rise above it. And I, Karen met me and I was walking. Then she saw me decline. I mean, she really yeah, saw I, me decline. Have you 30 years? No? No, we met in 2001. No, Debbie. What? I don't know. We met in 2001. I've lost time. We met in 2001. She's uh, in the so eternal much. moment. I, I am. I am. I, well, I heard too much. December 2000. December. I thought it was 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, I lost my father on December 14th of 2000. 2000, 2000, my granddaughter was born, 010101, on January the 1st of uh, 2001. Those two in incidents changed me. I came to Maryland. I moved to Maryland. I moved in with Karen through a roommate. 2000? 2001. So what, what we're learning here is that we're, that we're all crazy. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right. I don't like labels. And well, I don't like thing. ASD labels. And I agree with this about... movement to stop calling them. Let them call, be called what they want the to be called. The symbols of BTS. Mm -hmm. My question is... Uh, well, well I, I certainly the, wouldn't spread it around any diagnosis when I One of the thing about I even symbols read that to a friend not long ago. I said, them, yeah, I mean, I've got a list like this. Well, how do you think a red car when you're driving along? School. You'll see all the red cars <laughs> yeah, see, that you never I noticed before. Different. Sure. So, so your friend who was pointing out symbols in the BTS performance, do you think that they were intrinsic to the performance or just like literary criticism? People said, oh, he meant this because of that, or what? what's your feeling? No, 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 they intentionally put They did, symbols. they were intentional. Okay. Yeah, they, they clearly intentionally put the symbols. Okay. Um, but 
Right? That's because I don't know the why that would be considered sort of the I'm sort of the mentor of BTS. Well, who is um, it depends on the individual. Know, it's it's worth producing yeah. yeah. their record yes. label. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a mu well so he's a male muse, right. but he's like, he, he was a guy who went to uh, to an artistic mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Korea mm -hmm. and Somehow I got connect, connected up well, with Damien and, and the ones, some other in the one, not uh, Herman Hesse's novels. Because yeah. that's and what I said. Because Hesse was influenced well, by Jung, actually, and then he got into Jung. Mm -hmm. And but so now, you know, over the years, their, it's gone back. In their oh, albums, yes. and they have many that's albums. Now, yeah, I mean, it started but, out with that. Uh, in their albums so, now, when I was writing Tension, I just said, I Jung. Thank you. So you're off, John. We are off. And I yes. don't thank you for joining us. Nice you. Maria, it was thank great to meet you. you. Pardon? Thank you for thank this beautiful... Uh, You're welcome. Right. Yeah, this is yes. absolutely Thanks. lovely. Lovely. Thank you. And this has been Every, everyone thank likes you. the eternal moment, so if you would like to get your copy, nice to meet you, it is in the handouts for tonight, um, which is 1202.19. In the I'm hand further outs. away? No, I'm closer. Well, I am a little further away. Yeah, I'm up at Mays Chapel. So, is that over by the Preakness? 15 minutes longer. Huh? Is that over by the Preakness? I know, me too. No. Mm. I got no. You're, You're heading out also? House. Well, it's. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I, I have to get home tonight. Well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Same here. Amazed to see you. I hope we see you again. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry yes. Christmas. Merry, Merry, Merry. We'll be here on the first Monday of 2020. Okay, you're skipping December. Okay. Well, this is December. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. My mother's happy birthday, Mom. <laughs> my mother turned 95 today. I was oh, with her on, on Thanksgiving. We did her birthday. Pretty elderly on as well. My my father. Well, you would, my father. Turns, you wouldn't call my mother elderly if you met her. Uh, okay. And she's had three strokes, but you wouldn't call her elderly. No, I don't. My father. She runs circles around me. It's my father's what? birthday. <laughs> I have a couple crutches in the car and a wheelchair. Would you like them? Uh, no thanks. I'm no. trying to avoid those. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> me too. So Debbie, it was my father's birthday today too. He's 97. Oh, and that's he's still. Cool. Well, that's he did, no, he, he's died. But. Oh no, my we lost oh, my yeah. father in he was uh, in two thousand, which is why I know I moved in with you in two thousand one. Mm -hmm. uh, where did my gloves go? That was such so a. I must be in the car. Uh, yeah. So, oh, you know that's that's fun. Well, it's uh, nice to see you. It's nice to to yes. meet you. I've been as I say, been watching your your videos since uh, 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 John. Uh, Told well, me it's about you. Been one of our back in June. Better or best meetings. So. <laughs> it's good to have a have a crowd. Yeah, and thank you, thank you so much for your uh, review. Well, Maker. oh, I, appreciate I that uh, very much. was very very intrigued by the book. I thought it was it was everything that the other book was not that got all the popularity. Yeah. And um, I would highly recommend it to anyone. And I know how hard it is to get reviews because I can't even get reviews. You know, Skip, what I've learned about myself through listening and hearing what you were saying, too, is no one ever, ever told me what to believe, ever. And I think religion messes up a lot of people mm -hmm. when they're told what to believe. Yeah. I really do. And, I'm, of course, Donnie, I mean, he, he his religion and his different experiences in mine are amazing. When I told the pastor I wasn't going to do the Apostles' Creed because my can't condemn my father, my mother to hell, right? Because they said she was Jew. He said, I understand that. That makes sense. No one ever told me ever how to believe in anything. That has made a big difference. And I didn't realize so many people have been told. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They've been told what they have to believe. And I'm learning that. Yeah. I'm learning that. Because that does have a big effect on your life. It does. I was raised Catholic in a Southern Baptist household, and I know that doesn't make any sense. And my father no, never knew. No, that's no, Debbie. You were, that, that, you were damn from the moment that, you were born. I was, that and, I'm, and my really husband was Jewish. Interesting. Yeah. 
And my husband was Jewish. You so. were raised Baptist, but were, no. When I was raised Catholic. Well, did they just say let's go be Catholic if they uh, were Baptist? No. Uh, my mother had a friend. My father was. My mother was raised Catholic. My father would not sign a paper when he married her that he would raise all the children Catholic. She had us all sprinkled anyway. My father never knew that. Okay. <laughs> then my mother had a friend, Marie Haas, so, whose little so you girl were raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic with Pat with Patty Haas, Marie's Haas's daughter. My father never knew I was raised Catholic. Oh, I see. So he was the Baptist. He was the Baptist. The, which is interesting are, because the Scottish family for my girl was Catholic. <laughs> the, these are women's are secrets, so I'll tell you two you secrets my mother to told me. Uh, no, uh, Southern Cleveland, but okay. then by way of West Virginia. But uh, my dad, though, was from Bowman, Arkansas, and I'm Deborah yeah, A. I Bowman. That's the name. From Arkansas You're Arkansas. kidding. I think it was Perigo. Where? Perigo. What's that near? Jonesboro? Uh, it's a little south of Memphis. Wow. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, Bowman, Arkansas. I went there because uh, my oldest sister was killed in a car wreck when she was about two months old, and so I was went looking for her. So that's the only time I've been there. I went oh. looking for her graveside you know, back in back in the nineties. Hmm. Yeah, he's that's from Perigo, my mom's from Memphis. Wow. So my mother told me two deep two dark secrets. secrets. Two secrets. On, secrets on her deathbed. I mean, literally on her deathbed. She she was, you know, in the hospital for the final time, and we had just a remarkable two weeks together. I mean, I I stayed in her room in the hospital, and we just shared so much together. It was really a wonderful time and precious. And, but she told me two things that I never knew and I'm not sure my father ever knew. One of them, one of them was, <laughs> the easiest one was that uh, she voted for JFK in 1960 <laughs> and my father thought she had voted for Nixon. And I was 14 at the time and I thought my parents both voted for Nixon. But she admitted that she voted for JFK. <laughs> that was one That's of huge. Secrets. That's yeah. huge. But the big se but then the big secret was that my grandmothers had had five abortions between them in the nineteen twenties. Oh my gosh, in the twenties? Yeah. And they didn't die? Yeah, they I mean, didn't the die. Abortions back then. But I, 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 my mom butchery. told me about those. They yeah. yeah but, but they both had three children, the you know, three surviving children. But one of them had had three abortions, wow. and the other That's two. That's incredible that they and survived them. Pardon? It's incredible that well, they survived them. Mom yeah. they yeah. told them. me there was a lot of that going on. Yeah, because because there was they, used code they didn't have code. code yeah, they didn't have yeah. contraception. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. birth control. Exactly. And, you know, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Oh boy. So people. People don't understand what they're not, what they're asking for when they when they want to um, make abortion illegal again. Yeah, um, you know. Yeah. Watch the movie Dirty Dancing. Yeah, yeah. we'll have a prohibition while we're at it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let's turn us all into criminals. Right. Yeah. Well, what, one of the things I did notice in in science is. With the girls of today, they're so different than my girls of the 60s in the sense that when they see sonograms now, okay, and you see that child, it's totally, totally different than when we were not thinking in that form. And I've seen 16 and 17 year old girls really get upset at their parents because they might have made some decisions that they feel shouldn't have made. It's very mm -hmm. interesting because that is not how we felt in the 60s yeah. and such. It's well, very interesting. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a difficult question, but, mm -hmm. the, but I, I'm just, the right now. you know, and there's that not is. there's not a good answer to it, but I'm convinced that, that um, you know, it's, it's, 
an evil that we have to accept in our society mm -hmm. because if we don't, mm -hmm. the, the evil of not accepting it is even worse, by far. <laughs> So. Well, this has been very interesting. It has. Well, it's been. It's so, the first the Monday in January. First Monday in January, we'll be here. Okay. Well, now yeah. we know where it is. Right. And Karen and I, even though we didn't see each other for, for two, two years, because I was busy years. hiding, being a widow, well, she knows mm -hmm. I'm here. falling apart. Yeah. Um, and she. This is really the first time Annapolis. I'm reaching out. Oh, well, that's good. I met John through my blog and. Um, we started communicating. Good. He told me about oh, you. I started watching the videos and Wow. Well, Karen it, it, and I have known each other. There, there's plenty to watch now. There, believe it or not, yeah. there's over that a thousand so videos now. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. I'm wish you the best. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Nice warm hand. Thank you. So, lots of love. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, anyway, nice seeing you tonight, Karen, and thank you for coming. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. All of you. Thank you.